We are continuing our study in the Holy Doctrine of the Holy Spirit tonight. This is our third session, and we are on page seven of the notes. But let's kind of back up to review from where we've been after uh, some introduction on the Holy Spirit. We then uh, began to look at uh, the fact that the Holy Spirit is a person, and that is very important to realize, not a force or anything like that, but he's a person. And uh, what makes him a person? It's not having a body that makes a person a person, but it's having a personality, which is generally believed to include uh, an, an intellect and emotion and will. And we saw in God's word that all of those uh, the Holy Spirit has. So we spent time with that. Then we spent time with the fact that the Holy Spirit is God. And we have a triune Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so we looked at the reasons why we can believe that the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, then we started into the, the works of the Holy Spirit. And the first of the works of the Holy Spirit is his work of creation. And we were in the midst of that uh, last week when we ran out of time. And that's where we're going to pick up tonight. And of course, um, backing up just a bit before we get to, uh, to continue on the creation. Uh, last week we saw the last verse of 2 Corinthians. I think it's chapter 13, verse 14. Where there's a benediction and the Father and the Son and the Spirit are all mentioned. And uh, with the Spirit, it's mentioned about the fellowship or communion of the Spirit. And that's why we have so much to learn. And we want to learn more about the Holy Spirit. Is uh, How can we have communion or fellowship with someone if we don't know much about them? And so that's why, even though I know when we talk about a, a study on the Holy Spirit right away, we think, oh, I, I want to learn about the filling of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and so on. But uh, there is a lot in addition to that to know about the Holy Spirit. And so we're starting at the beginning and we will work our way to those issues. Well, back to the subject of the Holy Spirit and creation on page 7. And we had Roman numeral 1 proof of the work of the Holy Spirit in creation. And um, while I think of it, by the way, on, uh, you last week received page 7 and page 8. Uh, you can throw page 8 away because you have a new page 8 on the notes that are in front of you. And let's see. We've got a chair here and a chair in the back, or you could pull one of the chairs off that stack there. And um, here are the notes for tonight. Okay, so back to the subject of the Holy Spirit in creation. And we looked at Roman numeral one, uh, proof of the work of the Holy Spirit in creation. And we started with a specific scripture, which is Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And everyone knows Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2 continues that, and it talks about the earth was without form and void and so on. And then it says that the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. And so what we saw last week, that uh, the earth was undeveloped, it was lifeless, it was a lifeless mass covered with water. And then this word hovering, the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters. And that word is, is, a, is a word full of all kinds of, of important meaning. It has the idea of surrounding it, guarding it, but also the word implies movement. 
And uh, we saw last week that Henry Morris, who uh, has gone on to be the Lord a couple of years ago, but one of the great experts on creation and uh, the flood and things involving the book of Genesis, uh, he noticed uh, that uh, that word hovering did have in it the idea of the word, uh, of, of the idea of vib- vibration. In fact, he translated the spirit of God vibrated over the face of the waters. So there is a care, there is a watching over, but there's also an energy uh, that comes into God's creation, and that is the work of the Spirit. And and we've mentioned that uh, throughout Scripture, you see this emphasis on the work of the Spirit is taking from chaos and bringing it to order. And that's what the Spirit of God uh, does here. And so uh, we looked at that verse, verse uh, Genesis 1-2. Now let's turn to the book of Psalms, to Psalms 33, verse 6. Psalm 33, verse 6. There are several other verses in Scripture referring to the work of the Holy Spirit in creation. It is not only in Genesis 1-2. Here's one of them. Psalm 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And and of course, in Genesis, we have numerous times where it says, God said, let there be light, and so on. And uh, the creation was done. And that certainly is referred to here. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. But then then it says, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host... And we saw, we mentioned last week that the Hebrew word for spirit is also the Hebrew word for breath. That's also with the Greek word for spirit and breath. Well, interesting thing about the two languages of the Bible. And uh, so you could also translate it, and by the spirit of his mouth, all their hosts. So in that little verse in the Psalms is just another little hint of the fact that the Spirit of God was involved in creation. Turn to Psalm 104, verse 30. Psalm 104, verse 30. Psalm 104, verse 30. When you send forth your spirit... They are created, and you renew the face of the ground. So again, another reference to the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in creation. Now, there's a very interesting one in the book of Job. And, uh, you know, Job has so many unique little tidbits in it about the work of God that are, are, are kind of easy just to pass over and, and not pay much attention to. And then you get into them. And uh, they are really something. Well, Job 26, verse 13. Job 26, verse 13. By his, that would be God's power, he stilled the sea. By his understanding, he shattered Rahab. That's referring to Egypt. And uh, all of that happened in Egypt. And so this is extolling what God has has done. Uh, Verse 13. um, Oh, excuse me. The the Rahab there does not refer to Egypt. It it would refer to uh, uh, other things. But verse 13. By his wind, the heavens were made fair. So again, uh, wind can also refer to the spirit. Uh, which really would be what this word wind is referring to. Because how did God, as it says here, uh, make the heavens, which were part of that creation in Genesis 1-1, how did God make them fair? And that's fair in the sense of arranged and beautiful and orderly and so on. It was through the work of the Holy Spirit And uh, his hand pierced the fleeing serpent. The fleeing serpent there. Some translations uh, have have translated that uh, also as um, 
Uh, let me find it here. Um, uh, the crooked serpent. And it apparently refers to the Milky Way. It was the idea, and picture Job. I mean, Job lived before uh, electric lights and so on, which dim our view of the Milky Way. And, and uh, in the Middle East especially, on a cloudless night, the Milky Way is just so spectacular. And so Job is picturing the hand of God and, and just seeing, looking out there and just seeing that Milky Way. And so they, they portrayed it kind of like a fleeing or crooked uh, serpent, just this big thing out there. And Job, under the revelation from God, is saying that was the hand of the Spirit of God in creation that did that. Um, Job 33 verse 4 is another uh, little reference uh, to creation and to the power of the Spirit of God. In, uh, in Job 33 verse 4, The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. We're going to see in a little bit that verse in Genesis where God breathed into man the breath of life. And that word breath, again, is the same word as spirit. This is the spirit of God that, that God breathed into Adam. And uh, the book of Genesis um, has that. And then people just kind of float by it, don't give much more thought. And then all of a sudden, here you come to this in the book of, of uh, Job of all places, that the Spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. So again, the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in creation. Then in Isaiah chapter 40, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 12 to 14. Isaiah 40, verses 12 to 14. Uh, this is a tremendous passage uh, referring uh, to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is described here as the God who doesn't need to be taught. You know, you cannot teach God a thing. We would like to sometimes, but we can't. And the Holy Spirit is God, and the Holy Spirit is God who does not need to be taught. He needs no counseling. Uh, he needs no instruction, no assistance. And he's the one that measured the waters. We'll, we'll look at it. Uh, who has measured the waters of the hollow of his hand? Uh, or in the hollow of his hand. In other words, referring to the, the, the majesty of God. That God is so immense that, of course, God is spirit, and certainly the spirit of God is spirit. It has no physical hand, but it's the picture that if he did have a hand, it would be so big that all the waters of all the oceans could fit into his hand. Um, and marked off the heavens with a span. Span was, was kind of a, a space like that between your thumb and your big finger. And um, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure. Puts the, he has a measuring spoon that's so big that all the dust everywhere could fit in it. Weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. But I said this is referring to the Spirit. How can I say that? Well, verse 13. Who has measured the Spirit of the Lord? So this is what he's been referring to. Or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? And who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? So that again is, is a reference to the Holy Spirit uh, in creation and his intimate connection with the plan and management of the universe, is, uh, his fingerprints are all on that in these verses. Now also when we consider the fact that the Holy Spirit was involved in creation, there's also think of the word, use of the word Elohim. Elohim is 
the word in Hebrew that is translated God in Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word in Hebrew is Elohim. Happens to be a plural word. And yet, in, in Hebrew, the word created is not in plural. Now, we don't, we don't make our verbs singular and plural, but in some languages they do, including Hebrew. And you would normally have a plural noun has to go with a plural um, verb. But this breaks that rule. It's a plural noun because of the triunity of God, which includes the Holy Spirit. So when it says... Elohim created the heavens and the earth. That is referring to the Holy Spirit in the same sense that it's referring to the Father and to the Son. Then you'll see on your notes, number two, the nature of the creative work. First of all, it's created with order. And again, the Holy Spirit hovered over uh, that uh, lifeless mass that's covered with water and uh, turned it into a world of order. And uh, we saw that in Psalm 33, verse 6. Then the creation uh, with beauty and arrangement. We saw that in Job 26, 13. And that is attributed to the Holy Spirit. So you could say that in the Bible, the Holy Spirit, or excuse me, the Father is seen as the designer of creation. The Son in the New Testament is explained is the one who executes the design. And the Holy Spirit is the one who finished and brings to conclusion the work of God in creation. And there's a parallel there with our salvation. The Father has planned our salvation and has willed our salvation. And the New Testament talks about his election and his choosing and so on. The Son makes it possible through his death. And then the Holy Spirit brings it to final execution. It's the Holy Spirit who brings life to this spiritually dead person. Just like it was the Holy Spirit who brought life to that clay, uh, uh, lifeless uh, hunk of, of dirt that was Adam who became a living soul. Well, turning the page to page uh, 8, and this is the new page 8. Last week we gave out a page 8, didn't reach it. You can throw that one away because you have on the top sheet of your notes tonight a new page 8 has something on it that's not on the old one. Well, we have, first of all, the creation of life, talking about the fact of, of God's uh, creating and, and the work of the Spirit in that. Job 33, 4, we already saw, but let's turn to the verse that we referred to, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Genesis 2, verse 7. So this is uh, the creation of Adam. The creation of Adam is referred to in chapter 1, but chapter 2 tells it again with more detail. So Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, or you could say the spirit of life. And the man became a living creature. So Adam had spiritual life, the life of the Spirit breathed into him, and he became a living creature. Now, the spiritual aspect of that life died the moment that he sinned. Remember, God had, had told them before Adam and Eve sinned that if you, if you eat this fruit and disobey me, uh, you will die. Now, Adam physically lived 939 years. He did not die the moment that he uh, ate that food, fruit. And I tend to think that those 939 years began at the time of his uh, disobedience and sin. 
that that would be when the body began to die and began to uh, decay and go downward and so on, age. The body began to age, I would think, at the moment of his sin. The Bible doesn't say that, can't prove that, but I, that's a hunch that I have. But anyway, uh, so his body didn't die at that point. Now, later, 939 years later, when it did die, it was because of sin and the curse of sin. And that was God's grace that God didn't uh, bring death to his body at that moment. But he did die at the moment of his sin. He died spiritually. And that spirit that that had been breathed into him, uh, that died in his life. And he no longer had fellowship with the living God until uh, there was a substitute who died and the sacrifice and uh, the, ri- the coming righteousness of Christ was credited to his account just as it is to ours when we believe. So, but anyway, the creation of life, uh, Genesis 2-7. So the work of the Holy Spirit in creation is to bring glory to God. That wonderful verse in Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. And as the heavens are declaring the glory of God, that is a tremendous reminder that the whole purpose of the, of the Spirit of God in his part of creation and all the order that he brought to creation was not just to make a beautiful place to, for us, but it was to bring glory to God. And it has been ever since. Now, in, in your notes, I went to a kind of a new subsection here. The end result of the Holy Spirit's work in the Old Testament. Uh, God hides his face due to our sin. But the Holy Spirit unveils God's face. What do I mean by that? Well, turn to Psalm 104. Psalm 104. So as you can see, a study of the Holy Spirit is not like the study of a book where we just systematically go through a book, verse 1, verse 2, but study like this makes us jump all over the Bible. But, uh, but that's good. We need to do that. Psalm 104, uh, verse 29 and 30. Psalm 104, verse 29. The psalmist uh, speaking to God, when you hide your face, they are dismayed. That they would be sinners. God hides his face from sinners. Uh, that, that there is no fellowship of a holy God with sinners. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Verse 30, when you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. So in a real sense, the work of salvation in our heart that is brought about through the power of the spirit of God unveils the hidden face of God for us. Uh, That's just a little truth that's hidden away uh, in the Old Testament. Psalm 51. Uh, Probably everyone's more familiar with uh, this verse in Psalm 51. This Psalm 51 is uh, one of the two Psalms that David wrote after his uh, sin with Bathsheba and Uriah and his confession and getting right with God. And Psalm 51, uh, verse 9, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. So it talks about God's hiding his face. Verse 10, Create in me a clean spirit, O God, and renew a right spirit. He wants to be spiritually right with God within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. So again, sin causes God to hide his face. The Spirit of God unveils that. Uh, just, just a little um, t- 
tidbit in the Old Testament about the work of, of, of the Holy Spirit. Then turn to the book of Ezekiel, prophet Ezekiel, just, just before Daniel. Ezekiel 39.29, an interesting reference again to this hiding of the face of God. Uh, 39.29, God had a promise to Israel, uh, so much of Jeremiah and Isaiah and Ezekiel deal with, with God's bringing, uh, preaching to Israel concerning their sin and judgment and so on. Well, verse 29, I will not hide my face anymore from them. That would be, the them would refer to the Jewish people. When I pour out my spirit upon the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. So face hidden, face revealed when he pours out his spirit. So that's kind of in a nutshell for the believer, the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. And we've all um, seen or maybe even done it ourselves, play peekaboo with children. You know, you cover your face and then you go peekaboo. Every little kid laughs at that. Have you ever seen a little kid not laugh? And enjoy that. They just they just love the face of this person that that they love being revealed. And think about that with the Holy Spirit doing that with us, with revealing the face of the Father. And as a believer, we love that. Well, then we go on to the work of the Holy Spirit in the direct revelation of God. So we've had the work of the Spirit in creation. Now, another important theme in the Bible is the role of the Holy Spirit in the direct revelation of God. God has revealed himself. Uh, behind the messages of the Old Testament prophets was the unseen work of the Holy Spirit in imparting the mind of God to his prophets. Where did the prophets get their message? It was through the Holy Spirit. So we have direct statements of Scripture. For instance, turn to 2 Peter 1.21. 2 Peter 1.21 is one of the two most important verses in the Bible concerning the origin of the Bible and, the, and the, in turn the Holy Spirit's uh, role in that. Second, the other, the other one is uh, uh, 2 uh, Timothy 3.16. But uh, 2 Peter, uh, chapter 1, verse 21. 2 Peter 1, 21. For no prophecy. Now that prophecy means, uh, in its general use, the revelation of God. I know we hear prophecy, we think of foretelling future. When it comes to the Bible, prophecy is much more than that. It's the revealing of God's truth. So no revealing of God's truth was ever produced by the will of man. In other words, the Old Testament prophets, the writers of the books of the Bible and so on, they just didn't come out with this saying, well, I've decided to say this. And I'm going to say that it, it's from God. None of this was by the will of men. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So this is saying that the Holy Spirit had a direct role in the revelation of God. Whether it be the spoken word of the prophets of the Older Testament or the authors of Scripture, Old and New Testament, writing out these words, Paul's words and John when he wrote the gospel and his epistles and revelation and so on. Each of the books of the Bible, the writer... Uh, this is true of them. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We'll talk about that in a little more detail uh, later. Um, Second Samuel. I have an example of that with David. Second Samuel 23, verse 2. So after the first five books of the law of Genesis through Deuteronomy, and then you have Joshua... Judges, Ruth, and so on. Then you come to the Samuels. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, David is on his deathbed. And he says something interesting about this. 
2 Samuel 23, verse 2. Uh, verse 1 says, now these are the last words of David, uh, just before he died. And verse 2, here it is. The Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. So David, as we read the Psalms that he wrote, he did not write all the Psalms, but the Psalm, many of the Psalms, as he wrote, for instance, uh, this would be the source of the Psalms. That the Spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. Um, I'm not going to look up the, the references in Ezekiel and Micah, but uh, they continue that same theme. The direct statement of Scripture is that the Spirit of God is the means by which the Old Testament prophets and the writers of the Old and New Testament books uh, spoke and wrote the words of God. Then there are indirect statements. So we have the direct statements, Spirit of God did this. But then the, we have the indirect statements over and over and over again in the Bible. It says, thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord. That it is the word of God that is being given. Now in the New Testament, God continues to reveal himself through the Holy Spirit. However, in a few respects, there are new developments in the doctrine of revelation, such as the revelation of God. And by the revelation, I'm not talking about the book of Revelation, but all of the revelation of God in the Bible. Revelation is through Christ when we come to the New Testament. In the New Testament, the Messiah of the Old Testament, who's promised in the Old Testament, has come. He's incarnate. He's here in the flesh. And he constituted a revelation of God in his person and ministry. Uh, the author of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 1, talks about God who in olden days and different ways and methods and so on spoke through the prophets, has in these last days spoken through his Son. So, very important thing in the revelation of, of God. We come to the New Testament, the revelation is through Christ. But here's the thing. The Messiah ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we'll see that. I'm not sure we'll get there tonight. If not tonight, next week, as we go into the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the life of Christ. And Jesus spoke, preached, did miracles through the power of the Holy Spirit. Then there's revelation in the believer. Uh, beginning, of, you don't have to be an apostle. You don't have to be um, a prophet, uh, something like that. All believers, this is a blessing that we have. Beginning at Pentecost, the Holy Spirit indwells every believer. And he guides, teaches, and helps believers on a scale not found in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, Spirit of God comes on certain individuals. Not every believer in the Older Testament had the experience of the Holy Spirit coming upon them. That's a unique thing that we have as believers in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, some believers... Holy Spirit came upon for certain periods of time. But one of the blessings we have as a believer in the New Testament is that the moment of our salvation, we are indwelt by the Spirit and will be until the day we go to be with the Lord. And then thirdly, revelation through the written word. Uh, in the Old Testament, as the author of Hebrews begins his book by saying, God, who in the past spoke through all these different ways, which sometimes were dreams and visions and spoken words and so on. But in the New Testament, God has spoken through his Son as revealed in the written word, which is available for all of us to read. Well, turning the page... Page 9, we have a typo on the top there. It should read, the Holy Spirit and the inspiration of Scripture. The apostrophe S shouldn't be there. Uh, the Holy Spirit and the inspiration of Scripture. 
So number one, the importance of inspiration. It is important to know whether the Bible is a supernaturally produced book, which is the Word of God, or whether it is just the collection of the works of men. It is important to know that. Um, People have been talking about a debate that was last night at the Creation Museum in Kentucky, which, by the way, if you can ever get to the Midwest, make sure you go to the Creation Museum. It's just across the Ohio River from Cincinnati. And uh, so it's technically it's in Kentucky, but uh, it's very close to Cincinnati, Ohio. Fabulous presentation of creation. Anyway, there was a, a debate last night at the Creation Museum between Ken Ham and I forget the, la- the guy's first, his last name is Nye, but I forget his first name. Phil, Phil is it? Bill, whatever. And uh, I didn't see it, but I've been hearing about it and um, reading about it and so on. And, and from, from our standpoint, you know, if there was a clear difference there. One accepts that this book is from God. This is not just the work of man. And the other would say, well, this is just the work of man. It has mistakes in it. You can't rely on it and so on. And it becomes a very important issue. Do we have an inspired Bible or not? It is very important. And if scripture is given us by God, well, then we have an authoritative source for our knowledge of God and the things of God. But if the, man, if the Bible is man-made, then we can never be sure of our doctrine. So the whole subject of the inspiration of Scripture is very important. Now, what do we mean by the inspiration of Scripture? We speak of being, for instance, inspired by a beautiful sunset. Or we might talk about, oh... This music is so inspiring, and surely the writer of this music was inspired in order to write it, and so on. But that is not what we mean by inspiration when we use it in connection with the Bible. Now, the reason we use the word inspiration is because it is found in the King James Version of 2 Timothy chapter 3.16. And in the King James Version, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture, the word scripture means sacred writings, which refers to all the books of the Bible. All the books of the Bible are inspired by God. But King James was translated in 1611. A lot of years have gone by, and so today people can rightfully wonder, well, that still doesn't tell me. What does inspiration mean? The saying comes from God, but just what is it? I think uh, the ESV translation has done a wonderful service to us in translating it, all scripture is breathed out by God. That is a wonderful way to present what is meant by the old word inspiration. This word inspiration, or breathe out, uh, that we have in the New Testament is very unique in that we have, of course, all kinds of other books, non-Bible books, that were written in the Greek language of that day. And you have all the Greek classics and so on that everyone studies in philosophy and so on. Never in any other place so far has anyone ever found that Greek word. The only place it's ever been found is 2 Timothy 3.16. So that gives you the possibility that maybe Paul made up that word. Because he couldn't find another word that would fit it. But then on the other hand, Paul is inspired, and I will talk about that 
by the Holy Spirit. So the bottom line isn't so much that it was Paul as it was the Holy Spirit. What is this word? Well, what, what the Spirit of God did, he took two very simple Greek words and put them together and made one word out of it. And I put the word on your notes there, theopanoustos. Thea is from the Greek word for God, theos. And panoustos is uh, the Greek word for spirit. Or, as we've seen, that word also means breath or breathe. And so that's why the translation, all scripture is breathed out by God. Another problem with the word inspiration, the way we use the word today, I don't think uh, the translators of the King James in 1611 had this problem, the way they used it in their time. But the way we use the word today, we see that word in and then uh, we, we tend to think, oh, it must have to do with taking in something. Well, the breathing out explains that scripture isn't because something came in. It's because something came out. The breath of God came out. The work of the Spirit of God in, in directing, in the writing of Scripture. So Scripture is the product of the breath of God, or you could say is the product of the Spirit of God. That's what we mean by inspiration. So although it's uh, probably not uh, the greatest word because people misunderstand the word today. It is the word that is used uh, because of, of the 1611 that everyone uh, who's looking at what the Bible teaches about the origin of scripture uh, uses that word and hopefully understands what that word means. But breathing out is, is a very good way to put it. So, 2 Timothy 1.21, we have that thought, the Spirit of God moved the writers of Scripture. As he did that, he breathed out the words that they wrote were the words that God was breathing out. Now, does that mean that the Spirit of God was like a, a um, um, someone who's dictating to a secretary? and that the authors of scripture were merely secretaries just writing out. No, it's not that way either. Because when you, when you look at the writings, yes, they're breathed out by God, but each one, each author has his own individual style, types of words that he uses and so on, and all of that comes into play. It's, it's, it's part of some of the mysteries of scripture. One of the mysteries of scripture is who wrote the Bible. If you say the Spirit of God did, you're right. If you say the men, the authors did, you're right. But um, it, it was the Spirit of God using the writers. They're using their own terminology and so on. And yet the Spirit of God is directing that. That what comes out is the very word of God. You can say the same thing. Uh, who's responsible for our Christian life? Same kind of paradox. Um, I'm responsible. I'm told, be disciplined. And yet I'm told, but it's Christ in you who's working and so on. Both are true. There are several paradoxes like that uh, in the Bible. Well, tremendous, tremendous uh, truth about where Scripture came from and the work of the Holy Spirit. So, Roman numeral number three, inspiration is a work of the Holy Spirit. And again, that verse, we won't turn again, we already did, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. We have the testimony of the Old Testament writers. Uh, David, we saw that uh, earlier. In 2 Samuel 23, uh, you have Isaiah, uh, the same kind of thing, Isaiah 59, 21. And Jeremiah also in Jeremiah 119. So even the testimony of the Old Testament writers refers to the fact that these aren't their words. These are the words from the Spirit of God. Then we have the terminology of the prophets of the Old Testament. 
they say, thus says the Lord, or it's equivalent, and it's found hundreds of times in the Bible. And many of those times, the prophet or author of scripture is quoting God. This is a direct quote from God. But other times, they are saying things not as a direct quotation of God, but they are speaking that, believing that they are a spokesman of God and are directed of the Holy Spirit in that. And then we have the testimony of Christ. Doesn't get uh, much better than that. In quoting from the Old Testament, Christ is explicit in assigning the work of inspiration to the Holy Spirit. Uh, In Matthew 22, verses 42 and 23, why don't we turn there? Matthew 22... Forty two and forty three Matthew twenty two forty two Jesus is in uh, some conflict with the Pharisees and they're trying to trip him up and it doesn't work and then Jesus says things they can't answer and so on. Uh, so in verse forty two he's speaking to the Pharisees and he says, What do you think about the Christ? Of course Christ is Messiah, that's the word Messiah. Uh, So what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. That was an accepted title that they had for the Messiah, taken from God's promise to David that he would have a descendant who would come and be the Messiah, be the king, and so on. Well, verse 43, he said to them, How is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord? So he then quotes uh, David in Psalm, uh, I believe it's Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. And there you have the Father speaking to the Son. It's very remarkable since they didn't uh, see that distinction. But the point for us here for our study is the fact that he says David said this oh yes these are the words of David Psalm 110 verse 1 but he said it in the spirit this was inspired scripture this was the spirit breathing out uh, through the pen and words of David and then of course he says okay so if David calls him Lord how is he his son and that's a tremendous uh, argument in itself but that's not our purpose in looking at it. So you have that in Matthew 22, 42, and 43, and Mark 20, or 12, 36, that in quoting Psalm 110, verse 1, which is written by David, Christ affirms that David wrote by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Then we have the testimony of the apostles. For instance, Acts chapter 1, verse 16. Let's look at that. Acts chapter 1, verse 16. This is Peter. Acts 1, 16. Brothers, the scripture, and here he's quoting from Psalm 41, verse 9. The scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas and so on. So Peter said, like Christ did, that David was inspired by God. You have the same thing in Acts 4, 24 to 26 with Peter again, this time referring to Psalm 2. And he refers to it as coming from the Spirit of God. Paul does that in Acts chapter 28, verse 25, uh, quoting from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And then the author of Hebrews See, the book of Hebrews does not identify uh, who the author was. And uh, many people have debated and considered, was it Paul, was it someone else? Uh, That argument will probably never be settled until we get to heaven. So we'll just say the author of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews 3.7, he quotes uh, Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11. And in chapter 10 of Hebrews, verses 15 and 16, he quotes Jeremiah 31, 33, and attributes these not 
just to the human author, but to the Spirit of God. Well, turning to page 10. So that was the Old Testament. What about the inspiration of Scripture in the New Testament? The inspiration of the New Testament, like that of the Old, is supernatural. And it extends to the very words of Scripture without destroying the human element and without losing infallible accuracy. The writing of the New Testament has the same authority, divine origin, and infallibility as the scripture of the Old Testament. Each, of, each book of the New Testament has its own supporting evidence testifying to its inspiration. Obviously, we can't do that here. Go from Matthew to Revelation showing the evidence in each book that it is inspired by God. But that is, is available to study uh, any commentary, uh, any, any um, good commentary on any book of the New Testament will have a beginning section on who wrote the book and so on and will deal with how do we know that this is inspired scripture and it belongs in the Bible and every one of the books meets that uh, qualification. Well then we have the New Testament is authenticated by Christ. It's part of part of uh, looking at the role of the Holy Spirit in inspiring the New Testament. Um, turn to John 16. John 16, verses 12 to 15. John 16, 12. John 16, 12. I still have, this is Jesus in the upper room with the disciple just before going to the cross the next day. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Jesus said he would have to leave many things unrevealed. He just does not have opportunity to tell them everything. Well, then verse, uh, verse um, 13. Um, so, John sixteen thirteen. When the Spirit of Truth comes, when last week we saw that title for the Holy Spirit, good title for him. He will guide you into all the truth. And uh, for he will not speak on his own authority. Whatever he speaks, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. Jesus promised that the, the revelation that he was in the midst of giving them would be finished by the Holy Spirit. And as a result, we have the New Testament. And this is part of the promise that the Holy Spirit would be involved in the writing of the New Testament. And um, he gave to their words, the words of the apostles, writing these 27 books of the New Testament, the same authority as his words had. Then we have uh, the fact that the inspiration of the New Testament is claimed by the apostles. <clears throat> just look at one, just to give you an example of it. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.13. 1 Corinthians 2.13. 1 Corinthians 2.13. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. Uh, and you have 1 Corinthians 14, 37, Galatians 1, 6 to 9. Oh, that's an interesting one, by the way. That's the passage where Paul talks about, you know, these words uh, in Scripture are, of the New Testament are reliable to the point where he says, if someone, even an angel, would come and contradict or give you another gospel than what has been written in these books don't believe him, even an angel. That, by the way, has some implication for the Mormon story of where the Book of Mormon came from. And they are relying on what they believe was said by an angel. And what the angel gave contradicts the gospel. Paul says, don't believe it. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 2 and 15, and 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. 
Then um, Peter, while declaring his own inability to understand all that Paul had written, isn't that interesting? Have you ever written some, read something in Paul and thought, what did he mean? I mean, there are some things that Paul writes that really take some thought and to study. And even Peter had that problem. But even with that, he declares all Paul's epistles to be part of Scripture. That's Second Peter 3, 15 and 16. Then I put in conclusion, <clears throat> it has been estimated that the Bible in various ways asserts its own inspiration some 3,000 times. Well, that's overwhelming. Then you have to think, how often does the Bible have to say something in order to believe it? 3,000 times. Some way, shape, or form. It asserts that this is not the work of man, but the work of God. Well, we'll close there tonight. Next week, we'll go on to page 11 and get into the Holy Spirit in relation to Christ. And that's a wonderful subject as well. Well, let's pray. Father, we do thank you. We asked at the beginning for your blessing as we would go through this. And you have answered that. It's been wonderful to, to see these things and to know more of the work of the Holy Spirit in creation and in revealing your truth and inspiring scripture. And we thank you for that. We pray that that will just enable us uh, to have even deeper uh, communion and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. So as we go, we would pray for your blessing and we thank you that the Holy Spirit does indwell every believer uh, wherever we would go. And so we thank you for that and we pray in Jesus' name, amen.